Good morning and welcome to Garner Free Will Baptist Church. Um, if you didn't get a chance to read all the jokes and uh, go back and watch that, um, it's always great on a Father's Day to know what God has for us, but specifically uh, to, to hear all the dad jokes to go along with it. Um, this morning we want to teach you a new song. Some of you might already know it, so uh, if you would go ahead right now, you can listen with us. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything, and glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord. That's a pretty simple one. I think we got that. And so stand with us and let's joy singing about our God and Savior. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything. Glory to our God. And glory to our King. Are you grateful for our Lord? Amen. You may be seated. As our ushers are coming forward, we got some things by way of announcement. Uh, we are glad you're here on Father's Day, number one. I know some, they're traveling because they're going to visit their fathers where they are, and uh, we, don't, we don't dismiss that at all. We're grateful for them, and uh, we want to be able to honor our dads. Why? Because we have a father that is so much greater than any of us men in here. Amen. Amen. Um, a couple things by way of announcement. Um, after service, we're going to have a meeting. And so on Wednesday nights, we're going to start a summer sing program for our kids. And what that's going to entail is four parts. And so we want you to be a part of it, be inviting. It's going to go throughout the end of summer, and we'll tell you a little bit about what that is. Um, it's going to be composed of four parts. Number one, music choir. And so they're going to learn a song with the intentions of being here on a Sunday morning and singing for us all. And I love it when kids sing, and we invest in them, and so we're going to develop that and get them ready. Number two, a Bible lesson. Um, and obviously, we don't want to have anything without teaching God's Word to our kids. Number three, they're going to go to a craft or a game session, and so that they have a variety of what that's going to look like. And finally, what all kids love is snack. And so um, at the end of service, if you're interested in that and helping out in any capacity, make sure we're clear on this, in any capacity, then uh, we want you to meet right up front. Um, my wife will go over what those needs are going to be. Obviously, I'm not going to teach choir. She's going to teach choir and work with the kids. Um, but what we need is twofold. We need a leader for each group. And so most of those have already, people volunteered, signed up when they heard about it. Um, we still need a Bible list lesson leader, and so if God's leading you that way, then you can sign up for that. In every category, we need assistance. Our goal is to kind of run this like a VBS with four stations, 
and people going around taking them to each station and so that they get a variety and movement of what kids need and all those things. But if you're interested, twofold, number one, meeting here afterwards, and then number two, that'll start on June 29th. So not this week, but the next week we'll hit the ground running, and we're going to get those by the end of August. We're ready to have at least one song, maybe two, and who knows, we'll have a uh, kids' choir going. Um, our teen offering at the end of service, we're going to take an offering for our teens to go to camp. We've talked about it already. We have them going to two camps, TVR and to Youth of Flame. Those going to Youth of Flame will leave on Monday, and uh, they'll be heading out, driving to Pigeon Forge and coming back on Thursday. Um, be in prayer for them, but we're going to take an offering at the end of service. And so anything that goes in there will be taken care of for both of those sides. Um, if you haven't filled out your family information sheet there at the back, please get those um, covered. The, the final one, we've got a couple of things going on, but the final two I want to hit. Number one, a Mudcats game on July 15th. We have the opportunity that we can rent not just um, go to the game. We can rent a private box seat section. So it's our church together. We don't have to worry about who's drinking what sit beside us. It's our own individual boxes. Um, what that will cost is about $20 per person. But hold up for those of you who are thinking, like, I understand budget. Um, that is not just your ticket. It also includes some of your food. And so when you're talking about going and getting some of that, we'll talk about that as details and get that out. But when we say we want to do it that route, it's not just you getting in the game. You know a drink's going to cost you like $100 anyway. And so 20 bucks to get in and get a drink and maybe a hot dog, you're doing really, really well. And so if you're interested in that, we need to know by July 1st, which is not too far away. And so sign up for that because we need 40 to go for that. If we go to 20, it's a different rate, and we'll talk about that when we go. Finally, a ladies' retreat scheduled for July 18th through 22. It's in the mountains, so it'll be cooler. If you're interested in going, please sign up at the back and all those things. We have two other ones, nursery workers and teens. You can see those and take care of it. Yes, ma'am. Business meeting will be next Sunday, our special business meeting. We've got proposal for two property improvements we're going to discuss and vote on. Those are outside of normal spending, and so we need to be prepared to talk about that and see what we've got. Any other things by way of announcements? Be in prayer for our people who aren't with us. We have several who are either, either traveling or sick, and be in prayer for those as well. If you would, Brother Watson, will you pray for us? It's hard to imagine where I'd be. It's hard to imagine where I'd be without you. The truth is, I've learned so much by simply watching you. I've learned what it means to care about people and put others before myself. I've learned how to live a life of integrity and have the heart of a servant. I've learned to honor God in all I do and seek His will for my life. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I did not. Thank you for guiding me, encouraging me, and picking me up when I failed. Thank you for living out your faith and showing me how to live out mine. As I look back, I can see moment after moment where your strength, your wisdom, and your love made all the difference. There's so much of you I carry with me, memories I treasure, and lessons I cherish. Today, Dad, I want to say thank you and let you know just how much I love you. Happy Father's Day. Again, on behalf of Garner Field Baptist Church, thank you for being a father. Thank you for what you mean to us. Uh, Father's Day is an interesting day for many. I, I think of it differently for myself as my dad's been in glory for six years. And so Father's Day for me is different, and yet I know how that is. But at this time, we want to recognize our fathers. We have our teens who are going to pass out a, a present. And so teens, if you want to go ahead and come on forward, they don't want to. 
Um, and so if you're a father, if you'll go ahead and stand for us, um, and a father, you're always a father no matter how that is. And I, I, I will give you a brief understanding of that in a moment from my perspective. But we would love to thank you for, for what you do. Um, and men, if you'll remain standing whenever you get those, those are not like your ticket to sit down. I'll reference that in a moment. But pray for Brother Phil. He, he's still in all my thunder here. Can we pray for our fathers? Our Father, we love you and thank you for all you've blessed us with here. Lord, we thank you for your leadership, your guidance in our life, because, Lord, we cannot help but be in church and think about you being our gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, above all else, you are the one who satisfies our soul. Lord, I thank you for the fathers who have molded us or guided us or shaped us. And yet, on days like today, for some, it's, it's harder. It's we, want, we want our fathers there with us, and yet, Lord, you have chosen a different path. Lord, I thank you that we're gathered here at church this morning to celebrate our gracious Heavenly Father who has given so much more than anybody else. And, Lord, as men, we look up to you as guidance and leadership in what we're supposed to do. And I thank you for the men of this church that you have called in different capacities to lead their families, to lead in their church, and to be spiritual leaders. And, Lord, I pray you bless them this morning. We thank you for them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Everyone else, you may stand with them. We're going to go into our next song. But I want to put one more thing. On the way out to the right, there is a backdrop for Father's Day. Now, don't miss it, okay? If you just look at the backdrop, you're like, okay, there's a photo opportunity. We'll have the chair back there so we can stage your family around it. But the third portion of it is in a jar on the table, there's these little tags. Now, we got to make it fun because typically the fathers are just like, okay, straighten up, kids. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And yet, we're going to make it fun where it holds best dad or whatever little tag with it. Put a mustache on him. Put a bow tie if he doesn't have a tie. You can do all those things. But we've got all that set up for you. So when you go out to your right, get a picture with your father today. I ask you, anytime you take a picture on a, a special Sunday here, make sure you tag Garner from Baptist Church in it because we want to remember it with you what God has done. Amen. Let's sing together. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me In all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God has God been good to you I mean, it's so easy we can talk about our dads on a Father's Day, but we're not here to celebrate dads. We're here to celebrate our Father. And our Father who has always been good to us, even whenever we think He's away, when we think He's gone, when we can't touch Him, our God is there. And this Sunday, let's relish in the fact that we serve a risen Savior and a Holy Father who loves us. I love your voice For you led me through the fire And darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father And I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God 
And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. I will see of the goodness of God. I will see of the goodness of God. Let's pray. Father, you've been so good to us. And Lord, it's so easy that we can Focus on everything else in the world that doesn't go right. Or it's easy for me this morning to stop and think about my father. And yet, Lord, you left me with something greater. Because I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend, but Lord, I've known you as good and always loving. And Lord, I pray this morning as we turn our eyes towards you, as we turn our eyes towards what you have for us this morning, that you let your spirit prick our hearts. And Lord, as we'll go out here and we'll celebrate or we'll we'll mourn and we'll have all different views of how this day goes, but Lord, let it be known today. You're a good, good father. And we love you. Lord, bless our word, the reading of your word this morning. Bless this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's Father's Day. And in case if you missed it, you can go in my office. And uh, this morning I opened my Father's Day card and I was instructed to wait. And then all of a sudden in my office we opened it. And there is confetti all in my office, so I apologize if it looks unclean. But um, I am thankful for my girls and my wife. I know my girls didn't go online and buy it. Yeah, y'all do understand that, right? Okay. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, but I'm thankful for the cards they've got. Um, I'm thankful for our cup of water this morning. And so this will be our permanent illustration. For those of you who can't see it, it says, Dad Joke Loading please wait. And I don't think you can have a Father's Day without thinking of dad jokes. And so on behalf of the church and all the men in here, I get to tell my choice of dad jokes. Happy Father's Day to those of you who don't like them. And so here we go. Now feel free to laugh. Don't throw tomatoes. We didn't give you this ahead of time. Are y'all ready for this? I don't, I don't, my wife had to leave the room over it, so it's, it's okay. If you want to be turning to Acts 10 because you don't appreciate this, I understand. There's a big difference between bad jokes and dad jokes. And that difference is the first letter. Okay, I'm warming you up. Here it goes. Why did the golfer bring two pair of pants? Because he wanted to get a hole in one. Okay, we're getting there. What did the baby corn say to the mama corn? Where's popcorn? (laughs) There we go. Oh, this one hits too close to home. Air used to be free at the gas station, and now it costs $2. Why? (laughs) Inflation. (laughs) Yeah, now you're with me. Don't, Don't get bitter, okay? We're in church. You know, I hate Velcro. You know why? It's a ripoff. And when does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes apparent. Okay, that's all for now. Y'all, y'all are with me? I, I see some men, they're, they're like really getting it. Some others are like, this is church, bud. What are you doing? And then some of, the, some of the women are in here are looking at their husbands going like, 
you probably know that one. I'm sure you're going to say that one later. Um, so I'll post those online if you want to use those again later, absolutely. This morning, I want to talk about, it's Father's Day, we have to talk about this. What does it mean to be a man? Hey, you know what, <laughs> let's go ahead and back up a second. That's an easy conversation 20 years ago, now in our current culture and society, that they don't even know what a man is anymore because there's 140-something different genders, and so they don't know what you want to call it. So let, let's leave that alone. Let's get not get political for a moment. But what does it mean to be a man? I, I don't know about you guys. When you grew up, there was a point where you wanted to look at your dad and say, I'm a man. I remember my dad, He was uh, when he was fighting cancer at Duke, and he had gone through chemo, and he never did radiation, but he had been in the hospital in 2012 for uh, 76 days. And I saw my dad go from a, a big beast of a man to, like, losing weight, looking frail. He can't get up out of the bed. He couldn't get in the car by himself. He's got tubes coming out of here, there, and everywhere when he's going home. And I'm having to give him antibiotics. And praise the Lord, I didn't cause him to get worse. Um, because they're, like, IV antibiotics you're having to give to him. I didn't. I wasn't a doctor. I didn't know these things. And, and I remember in that time period, my dad all of a sudden looking at me and saying, Son, I think you can whip me now. <laughs> now, I, I got to tell you about my dad. I, I get that honor. And I get to tell you about it. My dad put in hardwood floor for a living. And this is back before things got easier. Whenever he used to take the manual nail gun, he'd take that four-pound hammer, and he'd have to hit, and he had to go. And when he would hit, now, you remember, he's got to swing back here. He's got to hit it down. He's got to keep on going. But when you hear my dad hit the floor, it was kind of like this. It was like that quickly he's nailing. And I'm like, how's he doing it? Because if I'm doing it, it's like this. <sighs> okay, I'm doing it differently. But my dad was quick, and the Lord had blessed him with this. And so whenever he was, if you had met him, his forearms looked like a, a grown man's calf. And so when he'd come to shake your hand, you didn't just, you, you were scared. Like, you made sure you didn't have a ring on in that hand because when my dad just squeezed, his hands would just, like, crush you because that's who he was. He had bare paws. He wore a size 17 wedding ring at one point, okay? He, he had these bare paws, and if he said he was going to do it, he could do it. And my dad, when he says, son, I think you're a man. I think you can whip me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm glad you think so because I'm not about to find out. I didn't want to find out. Now, he could say that all he wanted to, and I appreciated it, and I made him feel that way. I'd be like, yeah, yeah I can take you. But if, if he decided he wanted to take me, I was going to count on I could run faster than him. And that was my whole goal. Because we, as men, some of our young guys in here, you ask the question, when do I become a man? Well, society tells you become a man when? You turn 18. As though all of a sudden at 18, that that changes anything. Like, when you were 17 and 364 days, you were not a man, and then all of a sudden you wake up and something magically changed in your brain. Well, the science says it's exactly opposite. Your brain doesn't fully develop until you're 25, so, men, you might not even be a man until you're 25. Now, your body might be in the shape of a man, but at age 25 and down, you just keeps on going down and down, and we keep depreciating, right? We get to that point where that's all we are. So do I become a man at, at 18? No. Do I become a man at 25? Some people argue you become a man when you get married. As though saying I do means you're a man. I've seen many guys get married and that doesn't mean they're a man. Being a man in our culture means so many different things. And so whatever we want to do that, my dad would say this, or I think my mom actually phrased this, and she says, when you become a man, you'll get a real job. Now, what does she define a real job as? I've got it written down here. One with benefits. I was working construction with my dad, and she said, no, you don't need that. You need a real job. And I looked at my dad and said, Mom said, you aren't working a real job. Um, so I, I demasculated him at that quick moment. But what does the Bible say? In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, this was my dad's favorite book of the Bible. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What does the Bible say a man is? A man is who he thinks he is differently. A man is one who thinks about this world differently. Now, I will tell you this. and This totally takes away from our day. But for some reason in men... 
we have to have a transition that women don't get. Oh, they get it. They, they watch it, and they wish it would happen sooner, and they wish they could kick it into us at fa- sooner and make us grow up faster, make us take responsibility differently. But I'll give you, for example, my daughters are already learning what it's like to be a mama. They carry their babies around. They want to make sure they feed their babies. They want to take care of it. Melody has taken on Picky Picky, and she wants to hold on to her, and she wants to hold her like a baby. And I never remember those things as a kid. I don't know of any guy who all of a sudden said, I want to to take and feed my baby and had a baby doll. Now, in our society, who knows what's coming? That, that line might not work anymore, okay? But that is not how God designed us. Men, God has designed us completely different. God has designed us to be the ones who go out and, and we, we shoot people with BB guns or we go out and we play and we get away from video games, by the way, take that plug and run with it. And we go and we do things with our hands that you look outside and you see a guy riding a lawnmower and you say, I want to ride that lawnmower. I want to drive that tractor. Why is somebody else using the excavator? I want the excavator. You want the things that are different because God has designed us different. But as we grow up, we learn that there are things that are different. We have to grow into responsibility. A man gets married and he doesn't become a husband and and a protector that way. He has to realize at that point he's taking care of his wife. I remember the day we got married that we ever, this is marriage day, this is everything else. I remember parts of it. I don't remember it all. It's ceremony, it's hoopla. Megan knows all these little girls are coming up to her because she's the princess of the day and I'm standing over there like, how are y'all doing? I'm ready to get out of this tuxedo. I'm, it's warm. It's like I've been sweating in it for like 50 hours, it feels like already. And, and I remember the, the wedding day was all about like the bride being the bride and us making our union and everything else. But the next morning, I remember waking up. And we've packed up. We're going to Williamsburg. And I remember driving in the car thinking, I'm responsible for her. Responsibility overtakes you. When a man all of a sudden finds out he's going to be a father, it's not the same thing as when a woman thinks she's going to be a mother. Like when a woman finds out that she's going to be a mother, it's like instantly she knows. Like my wife can say, like, yes, I'm pregnant, but she knew she was pregnant ahead of time. That's why she's bought like 50 tests when she was getting tested. Okay? But for a dad, I'm just sitting back like, yeah, yeah, and she says, you're going to be a dad. I'm like, okay. And I remember with Melody, it's probably differently with Viola and Evelyn because I already knew the process. But I remember Melody like, yeah, I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to be a dad. Yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to be a dad. And then she was born. And when Melody was born, Melody was born quickly. Not, it, didn't, it wasn't that we were at the hospital for a short period of time, but the doctor wasn't ready. He had to get all his garb on. This is pre-COVID, and he was treating it like that all of a sudden he needed a hazmat suit because he was a germaphobe. And so he's sitting there, and they're like, doctor, get in place. Like, the baby's crowning. And he's like, okay. Shield down, glasses on. or oh, glasses on before you put the shield down. And he's, like, getting all this suited up as though, like, my baby has some infectious disease, and we're all going to die. And by the time he gets down in position, Melody goes, whop, into his chest, and he catches her. Like, he did a great job. He caught my baby. And I remember, like, instantly in that moment, I'll never forget that day because Megan's right here and the bassinet's right here. And now I have a decision of responsibility. Which one am I going to go to? And she's like, don't worry about me. I'm like, but I can't. Because my responsibility has shifted. Now my responsibility has shifted not from Megan and Melody, but to Violet and Evelyn and now Picky Picky and Pearl, the, the, the Great Pyrenees. And I don't know that I can take it anymore. I'm, I'm shaking in my boots about all the responsibility we have. But what we learn is becoming a man is all about responsibility. But becoming a spiritual man is different. It's easy to say, for most of us, to say, I'm going to be responsible. But what about the responsibility of someone's soul? I told you on Wednesday night we would be leading this direction. And today I want to take you through what does it mean to be a spiritual leader? In Christian Smith's book, he was from UNC when he originally started writing this, he argued the fact of why are we losing teenagers. It's a good book. Most of you wouldn't like it. It's, it's actually a longevity study for those who care about these things. That means that he started writing it in one year. 
He did all of his research and his interviews, and then five years later, he followed up with the same research and interviews, and then followed again five years later. So there's three different books, maybe a fourth one out by now. I haven't found it. But he's been doing these. Matter of fact, he moved from UNC to Notre Dame because his concentration was on Catholics, but it covered everything from Baptists to Catholics to Mormons to Jehovah's Witness to non-religious people. And so in his study, what he asks the question is, is we keep hearing this, why are kids leaving the church? And his conclusion was they're not. He said what his conclusion is, is the the kids are replicating what they have. This is what he says. The vast majority of U.S. teenagers tend to be quite like their parents in their religion. They tend to share similar beliefs and tend to be situated in the same general religious traditions and tend to attend religious services with one or both of their parents. Now, what we think is it's always we have to protect them against their kids or their friends, and if we keep them from those people, that we will shelter them, which I'm not negating that. He writes a whole section about that one of the outliers that pulls them away is the influences you um, allow them to be otherwise. So don't discredit that. But what we say is it happens to be if who their friends are is who they will become. I argue it differently. He does likewise. They pick friends based off of who they are. He says it this way. On average, half of their closest friends do not share their religious beliefs. And the majority of their closest friends are not involved in any of their own religious groups. He he concludes this section by saying this. What are the two factors affecting teen devotion? Parents' devotion and their relationship with their parents. Who will your children become? You. Matter of fact, he argued this. It's rare for a child to exceed the religion of their parents. At most, they meet it, whatever the standard you set. You say, Michael, I I don't believe that. I believe that there's kids, I've seen them, who have risen above where their parents are at, outliers. If you study statistics at all, an outlier is someone who doesn't fit the norm. The norm says, okay, their parents have lived in this and not done that way, and we know it, and so they end up following after what their parents are going to be. But you say, well, Michael, but I've seen kids who grow up beyond what their parents are going to be. Absolutely. My dad would argue, if he was still alive, that I have grown beyond where he's at. Why? My dad didn't show me a religion of stagnant living. He showed me a religion of spiritual growth that he went from a man who didn't even attend church faithfully when I was a kid that I remember this. We did not go on Sunday nights. He'd go to choir practice, but then he'd come home. We didn't go to choir practice because we had homework to do. To, but before he passes away, God has moved him into a position of leadership in the church and he was a deacon and honored as man of the year on a Father's Day seven years ago today. And so I saw a religion of spiritual growth, not a spiritual of, a religion of stagnation. I saw a man starting to read God's word and learning from that. And that religion is what he's passed on to me. So for seeing me grow beyond him, it's because of what he's shown me. But we need to understand that it starts with the spiritual leaders in the household. Story, guys, I'm not just preaching to you. We don't have just one spiritual leader in the household. Sorry, ladies, you're just on the side note and otherwise. No, actually, spiritual leader goes to anybody in here who says they're an adult. Because we are pouring into our kids. And we are looking at them through a perspective of how can we lead them to where they're going to go. If Garner Free Baptist Church is going to reach out to more and more teens and we're going to grow a youth program and we're going to grow a children's program and we're going to have VBS where we reach out to our community and we have more, then we're going to do that not because we put up flashy signs or cool tricks or really great desserts. What we're going to come up with is that we are spiritual leaders who are saying, come go with us, we're taking you to Jesus. Acts chapter 10. We see a man named Cornelius. Cornelius is interesting. Probably one of my favorite guys throughout the Bible because Cornelius is just going about his life. 
We don't pick up and say that he's going to be like a, an Apostle Paul that's anti-God. We don't see Peter where he says, I want to follow you, but I don't. But I want to follow you, but I don't. I'll walk on water and I'll sink. No, we see Cornelius as a guy who's just going about his life, serving God. And the whole while in Acts chapter 10, we see Peter who's wrestling with God because he wants to only take the gospel to the Jewish people. He's struggling with the Gentile people. And so in Acts chapter 10, we see a man named Cornelius who was a father who understood his role as a spiritual leader in the household. So what do we see? He was a devout man to God, we'll read. God speaks to him in a vision, requesting Peter to come. And so when Peter finds him, he also has a vision from God. And God teaches Peter that we are all like him. We are all brought together. God has not created anything separate. This is that passage where he said, that I'm not created clean and unclean. I have created all things good. We're the ones who mess up making clean and unclean. And yet he goes into there and says, finally Peter says, okay, I'm going to go follow after him. He reaches Cornelius. He preaches the gospel. And by the end of verse 48, we see not just Cornelius, but his entire household comes to Jesus. Whew. That's chapter 10. 48 verses. We can't read them all. But let me synop put a synopsis of that into three things I want you to understand. If we're going to be a spiritual leader, number one, we must value faith. Look at me in verse one. And there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house. Underline that. He already feared the Lord. But who is he? He's a Gentile man. He's Italian. He's Roman. He's not Jewish. He's not religious. But he's one that feared God with all of his house and who gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid. Wouldn't you be? You go home tonight and you go to your wife and say, hey, I just heard somebody speaking to me. She's going to call the loony bin. You're going to be at Dorothea Dix before the day's over with. Okay? So, yes, he's afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? Notice, he didn't question who it was. And he said unto him, thy prayers of thine alms are come up um, from a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, for one called Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Jump down to verse 2. 22. After coming, he says, And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that fears God of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Notice his faith. He didn't come to God because he was promised anything great. Matter of fact, he is already worshiping God and praying to him it says always, always. Because he already had faith. He is a man of faith before he even met someone to bring the gospel to him. He's following after him. He knows a God created, which can we stop for a moment? This is a rabbit trail. If you want to write it down, insert rabbit trail here. We always want to come back to the conclusion that we must prove that God exists, yet down throughout history, men have always recognized that there is a God. It has taken us to convince ourselves that there's not. We go through and convince ourselves because we can't prove it. Well, prove to me there's not a God. That's a logical fallacy we cannot do. Yet when we go into the workplace, when we go out tomorrow and we want to talk about who God is, we say, well, we can't say that. We can't prove to them that there's a God. Foolishness. History upon history has said people who don't know anything about America know that there's a God. They might worship the wrong one. They might make sacrifices to the wrong way. They might mess it up completely. But notice throughout history and Scripture, people knew there was a God before you told them. We fool ourselves when we act like he doesn't exist. But notice what, what Cornelius did. Cornelius is already there. Cornelius is following after him. And he's a man of faith. 
And in his process, notice this, number one, if we're going to be a man of faith, we must, number one, overcome our past. It is so easy for us to stop and say, but Michael, you don't know where I've been. Faith is not about where you've been, it's about where you're going. Faith is about not who you are, but who you trust in. Cornelius had no past of God or no love for God. He was a pagan growing up in Italy. There was no record at that time that the gospel had gotten to them. Why? Because we're here in the beginning parts of Acts. Paul's spending all of his time trying to get to Rome to take them to gospel. And then he finds out by the time he actually gets there to die, they've already heard about the gospel. But in this quick, in Acts chapter 10, they don't know about him. And yet something had happened that he said, I don't believe in this pagan tree worship, hug a tree, worship the ground, worship Mother Nature, which, by the way, church, we need to be careful that we don't use that same language. That we refer to it as all things are God's. Because he understood that. And he was a military man. He's a man that's on assignment away from his homeland, doing his job, and yet he finds God. But he had to overcome where he was at. He had to get past the idols, get past everything else worship. Number two, he had to commit to God. Before the passage happened, he has already committed to him. Look back with me in verse 1, or verse 2. He was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people. He's already giving stuff away, and he prayed always. There's many of us in the church that struggle to even say the same thing about ourselves. And yet, he made a commitment to God that says, I'm going to follow after him. Now, notice this. He's not saved. Well, man, Michael, you're judgmental. I can't believe you would say a guy's not saved if he's praying to God all the time. Like, like Michael, why, why would you say this man's not saved? Like, obviously, he has to be. He believes in God. Do we believe in God? Well, I mean, I hope we do. We're here, right? So at some point, you've got some belief in God. Well, okay, pause for a moment. He, he believes in a God. He's praying to him, and he's doing things right. He's got to be a Christian. Is that what it says in the Bible to be a Christian? No. I think we pick up the world philosophy and we just say, I was born that way. I'm a good man. I can live after God. I can do what's right. And so I was born a Christian. No, you weren't born a Christian. If, if anybody had a chance of that, I was. When I was born, I went to church the first day that I was home from the hospital, and I never stopped going. And so if being in church makes you a Christian, then that's the case. No, being in church probably makes you a pew, not a Christian, okay? <laughs> And, and so, well, but Michael, I was born in a Christian family, so what? Does that make any difference? Does it matter if we know to give? I know many people who are much richer and lost than we are who give away more of their money than we ever will. Is giving a qualification of salvation? No. Now, do saved people give to the church? Yes. We are, we are called to tithe our 10% and then give offerings above and beyond. Man, I'm thankful for a church that even takes that view and, and says, well, even though tithing applies to individuals, that they say as a church we want to give 10% to anywhere we can. And so as an offering, we give that out. And that we want to keep on giving it because, again, God called me to tithe, but God never called the church to, and yet we go and we say we want to lead by example and take those things. But does me tithing or me giving, does that quantify me being saved? No. Why is he not saved? We're going to see at the end of the passage where when, when Simon Peter preaches to him, he receives the gospel. Because I'm going to tell you, what my greatest fear, I would easily just say, let me go to a mission field. But my greatest fear is in America, eastern North Carolina, is that we have many people who have grown up knowing about God and never getting saved. That I just know it all. I got it. I've got it figured out. But I do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's my biggest passion in this world. Because it's easy to look at the person who's not like us, 
Paul the pagan that, that drove me around in Uber several weeks ago. It's easy to look at him and he says, listen, I don't believe in Jesus, and we know he's not saved. But what about us? What about where we're at? What about people in the church, people in our family who say they're good people, yet we don't know? Because if you notice in the passage, he's not saved. His faith is he trusts in God, but this is not salvation faith. In verse 22, it says he was devout. He feared God. He gave to the people. He prayed to God, and he respected the Jews. He was a respected man, but he did not understand the way of salvation yet. And we've got to be careful that we don't deviate that and say, just because we're a good person does not make us a godly person. Good people die and go to hell all the time. Only godly people, only believers die and go to heaven. Number three, what, what type of faith? He has to seek to know God personally. Cornelius devoted himself to know God more and more to the point that God spoke to him in the vision. I, I don't want to make him sound like he's the worst guy on earth. I want to be realistic about the passage. Notice what's happening. He's praying to God. He's pursuing God even before he gets saved. Now, notice this. You want to be a great spiritual leader? People in here need to know that you pursue after him. You want to be a spiritual leader to your family? Your kids need to see that you are pursuing after God. They, they don't need to just hear about it or, or you say it in Sunday school or you say it to other people that said, yeah, I read the Bible today. No, they need to see you. They need to know when they walk in that they're going to catch mom and dad reading the Bible and that we're going to talk about it and we're going to do things to pursue after God. That means, oh, we don't like this one. Sometimes we have to tell our kids we're not perfect. We have to let them know where we struggle. We have to let them know where we're not where we need to be. Faith is not about accomplishing perfection. Faith is about trusting the God who's going to get us there. Number two, if we're going to be spiritual leaders, number one, we must value faith. Number two, we must value, oh, we hate this word, obedience. Don't you all hate the word obedience? Because obedience means that we have to do exactly what's said and how we do it. I think the reason we don't like obedience is because we like to, to accomplish tasks without perfection. Men, it's Father's Day. We're ragging on ourselves here for a moment. Have you ever gone to assemble something without the instructions? Case in point, sermon's over. You're dismissed. That's it, right? I mean, there it is. Obedience. And so um, this week, we when we got pearly... Pearl, I don't know where her name's going to end up. If you talk to the girls, they, they come up with random names, Slowly, um, any other random ones. And then all of a sudden, like, I don't remember their name. I'm like, you picked it. I don't understand this. And so we were going to get Pearl, and Pearl was supposed to be a puppy. And evidently, Pearl is a puppy. I don't know if you know what Great Pyrenees are, but I'm going to explain it to you in a different terms. She is a big white dog. Emphasis on big, and she's a puppy at six months old. And so... Four months old. I'm sorry, I got corrected. Four months old, and yet she's this big. Okay? She's going to be about 80, 90 pounds, and she'll get up to about 30 inches or so. Um, because she's a female, if she was a, a male dog, she'd get even bigger. She already can put her paws up and almost reach to about five feet high and when she stretches out. And so this week, thank you to Addison helping me. We go and get a, a dog cage and... Uh, we get the kennel or however it is. It's a 10 by 10. I thought it was going to be big enough. And then I realized the puppy is a giant dog. And so um, 10 by 10 is still okay for right now. We might have to go get a couple more panels. And Addison looks at me and he says, well, how do we put this in together? I'm like, how do we just put it together? <laughs> Man, come on now. Y'all got to give me some amen on this one. How do you put it together? You just do it, right? Like, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how it goes. But it, evidently, other people who aren't as smart as I am figured it out. So we started, and he's like, like, well, are you going to do this? I'm like, yeah. I'm a whirlwind when it comes to working on things all of a sudden. I'm just like, let's do it. Let's go. Like, anybody else in here like that? Like, don't, don't stop. Do not press play or pause or anything. Let's just hit fast forward, and it's done. 
and we're getting bit by mosquitoes and all these things are going on, so we're going quickly. We get it together. We don't ask any questions about is it square. We don't care. We can square it later. Okay, the fence is together. It's a box. It might actually be a trapezoid. I don't know at that point. It has four sides, and it's going to hold the dog in. And then he said, do you want to go and put the canopy on it? And I'm like, well, I was going to do that by myself. Man, have you ever said that? And then realized later, there was no way I could have done that by myself. That's the example of it. Thank you, Addison, again. I'm praising him this morning because I had to put this canopy together, and he's like, well, how do we do it? And then it fits, but it doesn't fit. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You go to put something together, and we're going, and Addison's like over there with the instructions. I'm like, forget that. We got this. And he's like, well, he's reading. I'm like, we don't need that. We'll get this figured out. There's brackets. You put it together. It's going to be okay. Show me the picture. That's the famous last words of any man. Now, I'm here to tell you that we are good men because we got it together with the tarp over it, and it looks like it's supposed to. I don't know if it's like it's supposed to, okay? I didn't read the instructions. They got thrown away. Isn't that what we do? Like, men, no offense, your wife says, can you do this? And we don't obey. We, we do it our way, right? Your wife says, can you clean the kitchen? You're like, yeah, I can clean the kitchen. And what she meant, she didn't say it though. What she meant was, can you spray the countertops tops off and can you get a paper towel and wipe it off and can you load the dishes in the dishwasher and then mop up and sweep when you're done? She didn't say that. She said, clean the kitchen. I'm like, done. We're good to go. That, I feel like when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, that's what we look at as obedience. God says, have a relationship with me and you're like, okay. Okay. And then all of a sudden we get convicted in the area and we're like, oh, oh I, I got to do a little extra. N notice something with me. Can we look at Cornelius? Look at verse 3. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and he said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up from a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name, surname is Peter. And he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel had sp on which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. Go back to verse 5. What if he hadn't sent the men to Joppa? We don't struggle with knowing what God wants. We struggle with obedience. I remember my dad telling me he, he struggled. And I'll be honest, I, I don't think I was old enough and qualified enough to help him with this. But he would ask the question of, son, how am I supposed to tithe? Now, we know how to tithe, 10%. You learn in elementary school what a percent is. You take, divide it by 10, whatever that is, that's your one section that's your 10 percent if you got questions i can take my phone out and divide your income up and tell you how much you should tithe we, we can figure that out right my dad didn't ask that because he was concerned about how to give 10 percent. he was concerned because he ran his own business and it wasn't like he paid himself out of the business and he's like so son do i pay, do i if i get a check for four thousand dollars this week do i give 400 of it and i'm like well yeah that sounds good and he's like but but of that check like 1500 of its materials and i'm like well no and I'm like, and he starts getting all this. He said, do you realize I've got complications? I'm like, I understand where you're coming from. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I know what the answer technically is now. But as a teenager, when my dad's asking me that, you know what my dad was asking me? Son, think about it. Think about what you're doing and understand that you're giving to God the way you're supposed to. We all know we're supposed to do some things. It's easy to talk about tithing. But we can talk about other things, about reading our Bible. How much are we supposed to? Or about sharing the gospel, or who are we supposed to talk to? Or about a being obedient here, or being obedient there. And notice, the response is, when God speaks to us, what did he do first? Number one, he obeyed immediately. 
Delayed obedience is what? Disobedience. Have you ever taught that to your kids? <laughs> Man, it's like, well, I told you to do it three times. You, you didn't obey the first time. Delayed obedience is disobedience until it comes to God. Like God will, will speak to us this morning and we know. It's like I'm preaching on one thing and God's speaking to your heart and you're over there like, the preacher's preaching to me. I'm like, I'm not even saying those words. I didn't even address what God's dealing with you on because the Holy Spirit's working on us and God is convicting and you're like, well, I'm going to obey him tomorrow, maybe next week. And we're great at delayed disobedience. We, we say, well, God, I'm eventually going to. I'm eventually going to do what's right. Jonah is a great example here. Jonah knew what God's will was, but he didn't follow after him. He ran away from him. And then when all of a sudden God gets a hold of him because of a giant whale or a giant shark, whatever you want to call it was, but a big fish that, got him, that swallowed him up and he lived in there, he spewed him out, and God says, now do you get the picture? Go. And so he goes and with bitterness never tells them to repent. Go back and read the book of Jonah. He never tells them, repent. He tells them, God's going to judge you. God's going to judge you. God's going to judge you. He didn't take the message that God told him to. He didn't even completely obey. And I think it's funny, you get into chapter 4, and he goes and he sits out under a tree, and he's just got this little bit of shade because he wants to watch the city burn. God's going to destroy it. He's going to see God do his work. And God actually shrivels up that tree. And now he starts cursing the tree because it fallen hits him on the head and he doesn't have shade anymore. And he's mad because these people, these heathens, they repented. Why is he mad? Because he didn't obey the Lord. The whole time he's not obeying the Lord. Listen, when it comes to our faith, we have to be teaching our kids how, what obedience looks like. We have to obey immediately. Upon seeing the vision, he acted. We have to obey without question. He didn't say, God, why am I going to this guy? Who is this Simon Peter? Where is this place? How do I get there? Can you give me the GPS coordinates? Can you tell me something? No. He gets up, he, he calls his two men, he says, go get him. Why? He knew the voice of authority and obeyed without question. And thirdly, this is important, he obeyed expecting God to do something. Whew. Do you ever pray and say, maybe God will do? Lord, please touch this person. No. He understood it. I have faith in him and I show obedience to the point that in verse 24, he gathered his family together. It says, on the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them, he had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Why? He expected God to do something. Number three, a spiritual leader values faith, he values obedience, but thirdly, he values family. It says in verse 2, he was a devout man. In verse 24, it says that he called all his family together as we just read. But look at verse 27. And when talking about Simon Peter, he talked with Cornelius. He went in and found that they were there, there together. Jump down to verse 44. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all. Mark that. I'm going to emphasize that in just a moment all which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because they that, that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and then prayed that they tarry on certain days. If we're going to be focused and value our family, number one, we must lead our families by setting a proper example. We must lead our families by setting a proper example. Notice what he did in verse 24. Peter's coming, he says, and he called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Verse 27, and when they came there, they found many of them were come together. He did not let them go astray. Parents, you want to know the heart of your pastor? 
If they're under your roof, they're your responsibility to the Lord. If they're not in church, it's not their fault. If they're not in teen group, if they're not in Sunday school, it's not their fault. If they're not here pre- hearing the preaching of the word, it's not their fault. My dad said it quickly, son, I bought that truck, I control where it goes. I was grateful for the truck he gave me. But he had the, the reins and power to say, this is mine and I am going to make sure you value what you value. My dad was a football player and I wanted to play football, but because it interfered with the Lord, he never let me. Why? Not because football was a sin, but because where we were at, they only had practices on Wednesday night. And then when it came time to go to school, he put me in a Christian school because he did not want me going to the local public school that would have been detrimental to my health. Is that indicative of all public schools? No, but I can tell you the one I went to or would have gone to, and if you looked at the statistics, you'd have been like, well, Michael, I'm glad your parents made a different choice for you. And when everything was said, my parents did not leave my spirituality up to me. They put the point and emphasis to make sure I was in the house of God. Look at Cornelius. He didn't make a question. He says, the guy's coming, y'all sit down. Do y'all ever remember the olden days where that's what our olden grandparents or maybe your parents used to do where it's like, come sit down. All of a sudden, somebody's coming. They're going to tell us about something. And they would come in and you would sit down around the couch and you have kids sitting on the floor and all of a sudden it'd be about nothing. It would just be, let me tell you about the trip they just went on. But families used to do that. We have neglected that and it shows in our families. We no longer want to control what our kids get because we want them to be happy. Notice with him, it says we must lead by example. We must be the ones putting before them what is right and honorable and just. And if we're not going to put it before them and we're not going to invest in that future, then why should we ever question where they end up? Why are kids leaving the church? Because we have lost our priority of putting kids in the church. We want to make it where they have to have something freely, something fun, and something that's not of God for them to be excited. If they're not excited about hearing the word of God, that's because we've not taught it to them. Number two, we must lead our families by setting the proper expectations. Notice in verse 24 and 27, he put before them what they were going to and told them they were going to hear that to the point that before Peter arrived, they all knew they were going to hear the word of the Lord. He came for them telling them, I liken it to my father-in-law a couple of weeks ago. He, he comes before us and he says, I want all the family to come together. And so we have to like all plan to be there at a certain time at their house in Wendell. And it's all of the, the, the brothers and sisters and the, the in-laws as I am and then the grandkids. And we're all sitting around in the beginning before he does anything he wants to. He sits down and he says, let me tell you something. And that whole time we're keeping our kids wrangled and we're trying to because what? My father-in-law, what the patriarch is saying, we need to listen to at that moment. It's an honor and respect that he's passing down to us that I want to pass down to my kids because I set the expectations of what they're going to hear. My daughters are going to hear this after church. You ready for it? What did you learn? Now, they're eventually going to say, well, well, we had snacks. That's fine. Okay, they're three and two. What did you learn? Why? Because if in the car we're not talking about what happened at church, they don't expect to get anything out of church. Number three, it's not just control their expectations, but it's control their exposure. Man, I... Okay, forget time. Nobody put a clock up, so we'll pretend like it doesn't exist. Spiritual leaders control what your kids are exposed to. TV, internet, cell phones, all those are the whipping boys. Church, work, friends, spiritual leaders control what they're exposed to. And if we're not careful, we're giving our kids an open door to so many wrong things. 
because we treat as though, well, they're they're already a teenager. Teenager did not exist. Can I? You want a history lesson? Teenager is a modern American phenomenon. The word teenager never existed. You went from being a child to becoming an adult. Read the Bible. When as a child I understood, as a child I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, what happened in the teenage years? It's a modern American phenomenon that says that we should live as kids just a little bit longer. Now it's no longer just being a teenager, but now it's college age. And we keep elongating that to the, to the point that our kids live in our basement for years. Because they never know when they're supposed to take the reins and grow up. And it's partly on our fault. It's partly that we don't want to give it to them, that we don't want to transmit it over to them and let them grow. But it's because we're also not controlling their exposure. We'll let them have video games sit in their, in their room and play on Friday night until like Saturday mid-afternoon. They haven't slept and we wonder why they have an attention deficit problem. We, we'll sit there and let them have exposure to their phones and that you can pull it up on here and see how long you've had it and how long you've been on that and that their screen time is getting six, seven, eight hours a day and you wonder, I don't know why that they're talking about things I don't understand. We're letting their exposure get outside of everything to where we can't control it. But when we control their exposure, look back with me. I told you to highlight this. Whenever he preached the word, for verse 46, where they... They heard them speak. Uh, back it up. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all. If we do it right, if we could set a right example for our families, if we put the right expectations for our families, and if we control their exposure, verse 44, the Holy Ghost fell on all that heard the word. I, I wish I could be the preacher that Peter was. I wish I could make sure I have everything, but notice his whole house in verse 48 was baptized. His whole house believed. Why? He set the expectation. He controlled the exposure and led by the right example. Why? Because he understood something that we don't most of the time. It's more worth them getting it right than enjoying it now. Do y'all get that? I worked mortgages for about a year and a half while I was paying through seminary in Wake Forest. And uh, I would work mortgages, and I'd run the numbers, and I hate mortgages. When the interest rates were around 4%, you would finance a home for 30 years. And if you pay 200000 for that home in 40 years, you would pay 400000 for that home. When you start making your payments, I remember doing the amortization schedule for them. It's a big word. It says I told them how their money was going to go. And when they made that first payment of like $900, all this money went to paying your taxes and um, your insurance this money went to paying interest and a hundred dollars of that 900 went to making your principal payment and I remember them looking at me and saying well what are we supposed to do I said pay an extra hundred dollars start paying that principal off twice as fast because you're, you're you're killing yourself you're hurting yourself because you don't understand what you're getting into and when you start seeing that and you see its effects, you start saying, I need to take a hold of it and make a difference. That's why so many people in our modern age have said, we don't like debt and we're moving towards trying to pay things off. Well, praise the Lord that we're not doing what Scripture says is living as a debtor to those things. But it's like-minded of what we should be doing as a family. Control the expectations and control our exposure so that we can lead them where they need to go. We don't like to think about it this way, but we see a man here who's totally committed to the Lord and thereby all of his household was saved. We don't want to talk about it that way because what we don't want to say is that sometimes our faith wasn't strong enough to lead our kids where they should go. 
What about the ones who go astray? Forget that thinking. It's going to happen, but forget that thinking. Quit saying, I'm worried about leading them astray and start focusing on leading them towards the Lord. If we don't take the steps as a church and as a family to lead them that direction, we miss it. Matter of fact, the, the perspective's already there, Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose this day, whether it be the gods of your fathers that you served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Fathers, mothers, spiritual leaders in here, I'm calling you this morning to make that declaration. As for me and my house, we're going to do it right. As for me and my house, we are going to get our faith right. We're going to be obedient to the Lord. But we're also going to make sure our family has the right expectations and we're going to control the narrative in our household. We're going to be the ones that control what they see and where they go. But we have to make that decision. You, you might be a spiritual leader in here whether you're a dad, you're a mom, you're a deacon, whatever you are, however God has put you in here. On this Father's Day, I want you to declare no more. We are not going that direction. We are setting our sights on God and we're moving forward. Because if we're not, you're one day going to come back to my office and say, Michael, I don't know why my kid's going this way. I don't understand why this is happening. Can I tell you why? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's not a choice. That is a declaration. That is a movement forward that says no longer. Whatever I've got to weed out, whatever I've got to throw out. Can I tell you what that means in our household? We don't blindly let them watch Disney anymore. Their iPads don't have certain things on them. Matter of fact, their iPads stay dead half the time intentionally. Don't tell my girls that. Do we control it? Well, Y'all must be mean parents. No. God is more worthy than them being happy. But if we're not going to say that, then we can't declare, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we struggle. We're caught up in the world where our friends, our families around us, their kids are doing whatever they want. They're running one direction and they're seeking glory and they're wasting their time in this or that. And they're wanting to be kids and they're wanting to be something else. And yet, Lord, you've called us to be something greater. And Lord, I don't know about the rest of the room, but I want to be a Cornelius. I want to be a father who says, I'm going to do all I can to make sure that my kids know and love you. I want to be the good example. I want to be a man of faith. And I want my girls to be a, girls of faith. I want them to know the line so that when one day they start talking about dating this guy or going to these places, that I've already drawn the line in the sand that says, no, this is where we're going to be. And Father, I pray that you help us today, that we might make that declaration. With head bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, and you say, Pastor Michael, that's me. I want to make sure my kids are in the right place. I'm tired of leaving it to the world. I'm tired of leaving it to everybody else. But today, I want to declare that I am going to say, but as for me and my house, we're going to be like Cornelius. We're going to serve the Lord. If that's you, raise your hand. If that's you, stand to your feet. If you say, that's what I want for my household, go ahead and stand up to your feet. Our altar call right now is right what you're doing. We're going to stand up and say, I want to say, as for me and my house, I'm going to make that declaration. For my grandkids, I'm not going to leave this to them. I want to make sure, if that's you, if you in your commitment say, I'm going to follow after the Lord. You're standing to your feet. 
But when we're done, you're going out of here and you're going to have a conversation in the car. Listen to me. We don't wait until tomorrow to determine this. We're going to have a conversation in the car with our family and say, this has got to stop. We're giving too much time to the TV. We're giving too much time to the Nintendo, to the PlayStation. We're giving too much time to the Internet. We're going to redeem it now because we're going to follow after the Lord. I don't know what that is for you and your fa family. You're the spiritual leader who has to make those decisions. You're the grandparents who have to choose what you're going to give your grandkids on their coming birthday. How you're going to push things before them or not. Are you going to give them the things they need or are you going to give them the things they want? Be intentional that we're going to go out from here and we say no turning back, no more. I'm putting the line in the sand and I'm saying for me and my house, I am not giving ground to Satan. I'm giving it to the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for those who are standing. I thank you for those who say, God, you have dealt with me and that I need to make a difference in my family. Lord, I don't know where that is. I know for some in here that it's their grandparents. For some in here that they're loving other people's kids and they're pouring into them. And Lord, I thank you for them and all they do. But Lord, help us to turn that, that tide and say, I want to be intentional about how I live. I want to be intentional about how I draw them to you. I want it to be said of my family that they know the Lord. They know what sin is and we're not going to live in it. They know how to give time to the Lord. They know when it's time to sit down and hear God's word, they know how to listen and obey and follow after what you've called them to. But Lord, I know that's not easy. I know the hardest step is when we get done with prayer and then walking out to saying, I'm going to turn off the, the, the TV in the back of my car and I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to have to stop it before we have Father's Day lunch. And I'm going to say, guys, you want for Father's Day? This is what Daddy wants. This is what Mommy wants in our household, that we're going to live for the Lord. We're going to live for our, our Holy Father, and we're going to follow after Him because He is a good, good Father. And Lord, with that, I pray for those who are making decisions right now. I pray for what they have to go through this afternoon. But Lord, I pray that above all else that we follow after you in these things. Lord, we love you. We thank you for our families. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. With everybody standing, a couple things by way of announcement and conclusion.